this week, it's official. You're getting poorer and only the 1% are getting richer. Welcome to the Best of US Investors Weekly Review where we go over the top highlights of the Friday Platinum Call along with the Carries Call, which this is a doozy. It's one I've been waiting for. So stay tuned. Well, the Fed came out with a report that basically stated that the 1% became 50% richer, an all-time high since 2020, a whopping $45 trillion in wealth. Meanwhile, you and I, the rest of us, 99%ers, get poorer. It is because of the COVID, because of the pandemic, and the Federal Reserve's printing of money and then banks are being allowed to lend to their heart's content. Now we're in a bit of a pickle. The Fed printed and more money than ever during the whole pandemic. And the rich people got the money via the banks and they took it and they bought assets that increased in value. So commercial real estate, they bought stocks and assets that went up and they profited big time because they can borrow masses of money versus you who cannot. And so now we are paying the price with grocery prices up, with transportation up, with energy cost up. All of these things are now factoring into all of this creating one of the biggest potential financial nuclear explosions we have ever seen in history. In this next part, Mark breaks down the CPI number, which surprised everybody, not those who subscribe to the Platinum channel or to Best of US in general, because we've been talking about inflation and the cost and how it affects you and I and how our costs to live are accelerating. This week was really about the CPI and the PPI, okay? So the CPI came out on Wednesday and, and you know, Monday and Tuesday's trading, like I was saying, is, was gonna be sideways because everyone was just kind of waiting around to see what this report was gonna say. And we had a lot of Fed speak the two weeks prior to this and most of it was pretty hawkish, you know, like, you know, we're, you know, we're doing good on inflation, but we, we just, you know, we need to see more, you know, and, and you know, those, uh, those three or four or five or six or seven rate hikes, you know, that might be, maybe that'll be two or, or maybe that'll be one. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we got before that. And so when they came out, uh, consumer inflation, the CPI rose at a pace faster than is consistent with the Fed's target levels, excluding volatile food and energy, that's the core prices, jumped four tenths of a percent from February to March. Uh, core prices were 3.8% higher than they were a year earlier, the same reading as the previous month. So on an annual basis, headline inflation rose 3.5% in March, accelerating from February's 3.2% reading. Uh, and of course, CPI knocked Wall Street stocks you know, down by over 1% triggered the biggest one-day jump in two-year treasury yields and the biggest one-day jump in the dollar index since March of last year. Um, then uh, Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers, he was the former treasury, came out and said that the hot consumer price inflation report for March means that the risk case for the next Federal Reserve move to be an increase must be taken seriously. So he's talking about, you know, not cutting, but actually going to have to take it and in, 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 and increase the rate because because inflation is not under control and we're seeing three months in a, in a row where it's gone up. He says you have to take seriously the possibility that the next rate move will be upwards rather than downwards. And he said this on Bloomberg. Uh, he indicated that such a likelihood is somewhere between 15 and 25 percent. So then the PPI came out and the PPI, of course, is a producer's price index. And this usually comes out in you know, what happens to the producer usually is the leading uh, indicator of what's going to happen when the consumer gets it because the prices will go up. Consumers are going to have to pay that. So the core producer price, which excludes food and energy for some reason, 
rose by two tenths of a percent from the previous month uh, in March of 2024, following a three tenths percent increase in the prior month and in line with market estimates. But from the previous year, the core producer price index rose by 2.4% in March, accelerating from a 2% in February and surpassing the market forecast of 2.3%. Year on year, the PPI rose 2.1%, and that's the most in, since April of 2023, after a 1.6% in February. So the, the, the story is inflation has not gone away. And in fact, uh, it's, it's going up. And you didn't it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out because we've been talking about it on this channel for months you know about going to the grocery store do you see anything going down going to get uh, fuel in your your car do you see anything going down you're taking a trip airline tickets everything uh, home insurance car insurance you know everything is, has been going up and so you can't really tell me uh, from my point of view and we've been talking about it and Trent and I put out a video before the CPI it's just about uh, increases in in uh, in costs. In fact, since January of 2021, uh, this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Medical care is up six percent. Cost of apparel is up uh, seven or nine point seven four percent. Shelters up twenty percent. Uh, food and uh, uh, food is up twenty one percent. New cars eighteen percent. Used cars nineteen percent. So we do have uh, inflation and it, it really puts in a, you know, the, the Fed right now knew this because they have, they see all that information before the reports come out. And they know that, that the, they can't really lower rates now because inflation will, will kick off and keep going. So they're kind of in a quandary. And part of the reason they can is because the initial jobless claims, claims came out and the, and the jobless are not going the way they want either. They want to see higher unemployment and 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 uh, people without jobs to slow down the economy, but the number of people claiming unemployment benefits fell by eleven thousand to two hundred eleven thousand, uh, the lowest uh, one month, the lowest in one month, and below the market expectations of two hundred fifteen thousand. So the decline uh, countered the increase brought by the upward revised two month high in the earlier week, and added further evidence uh, uh, to the Fed. Uh, that they're not going to probably raise or lower rates, that the labor market is tight and the U.S. economy uh, is in line with the strength in the latest jobs report uh, and uh, probably will uh, be a negative for the uh, Fed to, to even think about lowering rates at this point. Anyone have anything to say on the CPI inflation at that point? You know, my initial okay. reaction is we should just expect the Fed funds rate to be where it's at probably for the next year. And we should just get over that because it, it, like you've pointed out before, it's normal on, on average, this is sort of that area where we're, where the number is. So I think uh, you allow that to drip back into the system, you know, 11 hikes still hasn't all dripped into the system yet. It's coming. So you let that work through the system, you hold rates at this rate, you take a you know the heat, but you normalize the system, you reset it in a sense, and then of course that'll cause a bit of a recession of some sort, and markets will go down like Robert pointed out 10, 15 percent, you know initially, and it'll create opportunities. But I think it's one of these we're we're headed into a bit of a storm, and it's just the way it is. Now let's move on. <laughs> that, uh, this is all government generated by the seventy four thousand dollars for seventy four thousand jobs it's created, which are mostly part time. Right. Anybody doesn't know that. Um, along with the health care that those people need, that's why you have another seventy thousand created in health care. Um, I think I think they should be raising rates to control inflation that they are creating, or they need to stop spending, period. Otherwise, it's not, it's not, you know, Mark going out to dinner five nights a week. You know, it's not Bob going out to dinner five nights a week. Um, you know, most of us, I would guess, because of inflation, uh, my daughters are telling me the other day, you know, went to the store to buy groceries for them and their kids. That's a $600 bill. 
you know, how many families can so yeah how many families can you know continue to afford that you know for right. food and it's 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 out of, it's out of control food is not going down um the numbers are skewed there's a big game going on you know it i think for them to control that which again it's a double edged sword right and the other problem is we have the 10 year going over 4.5 which puts pressure on the equities right yeah. so i don't know i mean um uh, i would not expect a cut period and the only way you're going to get a cut as we get closer to the uh, election and that's going to be political instead of you know what's best for joe schmo this week we ended Friday with a pretty big drop, over 1% on all three indexes. JP Morgan Chase came out with earnings. Now, the, Jamie Dimon issued a letter to shareholders saying that he's expecting the 10-year treasury, which is at about 4.5% right now, to be at 8%. And for all of you who don't understand how bonds work, when yields go up, bond values go down. Well, Trent, but why would yields go up on U.S. Treasuries? I mean, we're the diamond of all current, all bonds, all countries. The problem is nobody wants our Treasuries anymore. Nobody, in its essence, doesn't want to lend us money anymore. And that's why you're seeing U.S. Treasuries, both two-year, five-year, 10-year, 20-year, 30-year, going higher the two-year not off off the top of my head is approaching or at five percent now think of this you're the u.s government what is the treasury in relation to the u.s government well it's how they borrow money they issue treasuries on tuesdays and thursdays through a treasury auction and the yield is based on the um credit quality and the demand of those assets. Well, if there is no demand and people aren't, or countries or individuals or institutions aren't willing to buy them at the yields that they are issued at, then they have to adjust those during the auction, driving the yields higher. The less and less interest in the treasuries, the higher the yield goes. That's what's happening. So what is the government doing with these proceeds when they get them well they're right now they're paying interest payments on the debt they issued back on back when it was two percent now if you had a two-year treasury from 2020 that treasury is now upwards in value of close to five percent so instead of borrowing money at two percent in the past like during covid and the pandemic they're now borrowing at Five, four and a half, five percent, depending on duration. What does that mean for them? They have to borrow more money every Tuesday and Thursday just to pay the interest payments. Oh, golly gee, what a brilliant set of people up there in Washington, D.C. Wouldn't you agree? In this next section, Mark breaks down the effects of all this money printing and what is happening to each sector within the S&P 500. So I'm gonna go over the three indexes, the big main indexes. And uh, here's the SPY, We're looking at a year to date. You can see SPY has been going up and I'm gonna go out a year. Since October, we've had pretty much, you know, a, a nice path all the way up to the top and you can see what's happening uh, right now. And I'll zoom in on it just a little bit. Um, we're starting to roll over a little bit. We came up, we hit uh, the upper or the uh, upper resistance level, the intermediate resistance level, and you can see that today we are right trading right on the bottom of the of the uh, lower Bollinger Band, which has really been narrow because we've been trading sideways. And the 50, if we get past the 50, uh, we could the next stop on resistance or support would be the the 200. 
Okay. We go and we look at kind of a year. You can see we are in this rising wedge since October. And we broke out of that rising wedge. And we're seeing the 20 zip down. And we're seeing, again, the Bollinger Bands starting to, to dip a little bit. We look at the MACD, not a good sign here. We look at the stochastic and it's just dumped, you know, to the bottom. We go look at the Dow has really has some damage done to it. You can see we did the same same kind of stair step as we had, uh, you know, with the AI boom and, and the Fed going to lower rates and see what happened to the Dow here. And, and it's it's below its resistance level. It's actually trading below the Bollinger Band. It's trading below the nine, which just crossed over death cross over the, the 50 and over the 20 just crossed. Uh, these are heading down. Price actions heading down. 200s are right here. MACD is heading down. Stochastic is down. Uh, momentum is down. Uh, the Dow is just not looking too happy today or this week. We'll go back, look at a year. Uh, it kind of broke out of its uh, pattern also. You can see what's happening uh, with the Dow. Surprisingly, the queues aren't so bad because they, they still have, oops, they still have, you know, the magnificent four or three or two or whatever we're at now. Uh, you can see we've had that stair step, stair step up uh, when we come over, look a little closer. You can see that we're still within, you know, we're above the 50, but like this S&P, we're bouncing right off the top of the 50. And today we're below the nine. It's a really narrow band. We'll see how much longer this holds on. But again, they, uh, the, the MACD is, is dropping, Stochastic's dropping, our momentum's dropping, even on the Qs. We go out a little bit here, take a look. It broke out of its rising wedge also, but continued sideways. And we'll see if some of these can, you know, you know the, the big tech can keep it up. But Apple kind of came back a little bit this week with some news about AI. Tesla's still down. Uh, but you still have NVIDIA and uh, Microsoft and Meta still doing sideways movement, which is keeping uh, keeping us looking, you know, fairly decent still on the on the queues, even though we broke out of our broke out of our wedge. So if you break this down a little bit to look at um, what exactly is happening by sector, and you know, let's just go look at the technology sector. And it looks a lot like it looks a lot like the cues. It's almost the same chart. Here's technology XLK. Okay, you can see the the nines coming down. You see again we're in the technology sector. We're actually closing. We're actually below the fifty now. We're below the twenty. We're below the nine. We're coming down on the lower Bollinger. We've had a, a downward a, a negative MACD below the signal line for a while. Same here with the stochastic. We're having a uh, RSI with momentum down. This is technology. Okay, I'm just trying to find a good sector. Here's a here's real estate. What happened this week with real estate and the and the interest rates not going down? Here's here's where the Fed announced. Boom, you know, real estate's really close to uh, to uh, interest rates. It came down to the Bollinger Band, followed it all the way down. It's three days in a row, we're hitting support at uh, at the 200. If it goes down below the 200. You can expect further fall down to the intermediate support level, but again, MACD, stochastic, RSI, just not looking good in the, in the real estate sector. And again, we kind of started the week, you know, up, down. Let's take a look at uh, XLY. So when you see the markets go down, you're trying to find, okay, what can I swing trade or what can I invest in? And, you know, these are the, this is what you look at initially. And again, here's this is consumer discretionary. And again, it's down down the, the, the lower Bollinger Band. You can see all the indicators are down. We're coming down. We get past that. And we're going to continue to fall down. The next stop is uh, the 200. Let's look at uh, XOV. This is your healthcare. Okay, healthcare is really falling off. Also, you can see it dropping down below the Bollinger heading straight down for the 200. Again, we start dropping down the 200. That's considered very bearish when these all start dropping down. And, you know, two weeks ago, 
all these were trading sideways along and above uh, their nine and along their intermediate uh, resistance level. You can see just move sideways, sideways, sideways. And then this week uh, with the news and the inflation news, we're just seeing them all just drop off. Let's look at um, XLP. This is consumer staples, okay? Things that you need, same thing. Kind of moving up, moving up, looking good. Boom, down we go. Now we're under the 50, we're under the nine, the nine and the 20 are racing down. The 50 is starting to roll. We're following the Bollinger Band down, okay? Here's some intermediate support at 72, 73, uh, but the trajectory and the momentum and the trend is down in consumer uh, uh, staples. Hey, Mark. Yep. Do you ever uh, use what the candles are to interpret the direction of the market? You know what I mean? I the dojo. Yeah, can candle patterns I do once in a while. Um, but I don't need candle patterns in these cases. I just look at the MACD, I look at the statistic, and here's your momentum indicator, right. and, you know, along with the trend. I mean, if I'm getting to a point where I'm deciding on a swing trade to get in or out and I see a candle pattern, maybe, uh, you know, a, an inverted hammer or something. Yeah, I'll use that. But in this case, and I'm all Pretty I'm seeing is, is, yeah, it's, I'm just seeing it's, I mean, this is utilities. OK. And utilities was up. I mean, it was up above. It's been up for a while. Went above the 200 again. Here we are again, down below the nine, below the 20. Uh down here, we have the lower Bollinger Band. We'll see what happens with utilities. Um, XLB. Yep, here we go. This is materials. Materials did nicely. Look at that. Came right up. Here's the intermediate resistance level. Kind of hovered above it. And off we go. Down below the 9. Now we're below the 20. Or no, we're below the... Uh, well, we are below the 20. And we're now following the... Uh, lower Bollinger Band, and the next level of support will be the 50. So we haven't seen a sector yet that's good, okay, this week, XLC. So when I have trouble finding stocks for swing trades, this is why, okay, because the sectors are just not doing well this week. We had some swing trades. Now here's XLC, Communication Services. This is Meta's in this one, I think, and maybe Amazon. So that keeps it up a little bit, but you can see even today, we're down uh, challenging the 20 now, we're below the 20, uh, and we're seeing a little rollover on the nine, we're starting to see uh, convergence again on the Bollinger Band, which usually means sideways trading, but then you come down, the MACD's down, stochastics down, momentum in the RSI is down okay, again. So then we have a couple left, hopefully we'll find one. So here is uh, industrials. Industrials was doing well too. It came up, hit this intermediate resistance line, and that is my line in the sand. I keep telling everyone it, it can go along that for a while. And then you can see three days ago, we started dropping below the nine. And here we are. We're coming down to the Bollinger Band. We're probably going to touch off the 50 and see what happens. But again, look at the MACD, look at the stochastic, look at the RSI and it's on industrials. So we got one left. Will it save us? Oh, there it is. That's energy. And yesterday we looked at energy, you know, because it came up this week. And here's your intermediate resistance level as calculated by the Fidelity program. And it's been solid for me. One, two, three, four, five. Went over a little bit today. Here's some cells, hit the cells, came back down. And now we're under the nine. Okay. So now we've got all 11 sectors of the S&P. Not looking very good this week. So it, when it comes to trying to find uh, uh, stocks for swing trading or even stocks to invest in, you can see what you're up against just based on by the 11 sectors. A couple other things I want to show you. Let's go look at. Uh, oops, I want to look at a few more things here. Sorry about that. Let's look at regional banks because we talked about interest rates and regional banks. Mm. Yeah, regional banks are right at the 200. We'll see if that thing pops under the 200. 
it's not looking good by the MACD. Um, again, you know, everything's strong. The economy's uh, good. Uh, consumers are resilient. Uh, let's look at one thing that, that is good. Where's the money going? Actually, there's a few things we're going to look at where the money's going. Oh, hold on, please. Got the wrong symbol. The dollar. And let me make this a little bit better so you can see it. So you can actually swing trade the dollar if you want. You can see we actually today are above the 200. We're above the nine. We're above the 20 and the 50. The dollar is moving up. The MACD is moving up. Uh, you're probably not going to you know, see much in far as appreciation. You, you know, got 28, uh, 61, and we're seeing a little sell at 28.76. So uh, it went past that. But here's the dollar. Here's our resistance way up here. So this may be something you want to consider. You can see money's flowing into the, the dollar index. Where else are they flowing into? They're flowing into commodities. This is the oh, wrong one. Wrong one, sorry. This is the Invesco Diversified Commodity Index. And you can see that we've seen this last month money flowing into the commodities. But then again, you see what happened. It hit the intermediate resistance level. Uh, and it's kind of stalled a little bit and it's come back down today. And that's where we're at. Seeing a little bit of a rollover. You can see in the MACD. Um, so we'll see what happens uh, with commodities. We'll go into some individual ones. Gold. Gold has been hot. So there's gold. Okay, you see some cells. Here's where the cell limits are. The program puts it in. You can see right that's where we are. Went a little bit above, came back down, and now we're right where the cell levels are. The interesting thing is, is that it took away, here's your support level, intermediate support. It took away uh, your intermediate resistance level on the top. And it was there a couple of days ago. So it's modified that away. Let's go see if we can find it. Short term, nope. Long term, nope. Uh, so that's telling me, other than these stops, it has a ways to possibly go. But again, watch for the rollovers here. You're seeing a little bit of a slowing of the MACD. Uh, uh, so just watch out and be, be prepared for that. Silver. Silver. Okay, so this one actually has the uh, intermediate resistance. We came up, we've hit it two days in a row. It popped up, tried to roll out, and now the price action came back down. It's just tough to get past that, even though we've got screaming up, you know, nines and twenties. But you see a little bit of a rollover on the MACD, a little bit on the stochastic. Still, this isn't too bad yet. We'll see what happens with silver. But it could be, you know, a sideways pattern for a while. We'll see how that goes. Uh, oil, USL, commodity. Again, came up, hit the intermediate resistance level. Here's where the cells are. You can see it can't get past that cell level. And again, it went up, tried to make it, came back down. Now we're at resistance and right at the nine. So the nine's starting to roll over. You can already see the MACDs rolling over on oil. So something, you know, Oil is really news dependent. So if something happens this weekend in the Middle East, you know, this all goes out the window because charts just don't know that things are happening in the Middle East at this point. A few more. Wheat. We'll get into some agriculture. Wheat's been kind of rising up here the last month. Now you can see we've just kind of just kind of dipped down the last three, four days in wheat. See the MACD. Not a very exciting thing, but corn. Corn's just kind of moseying around, just kind of moving down sideways, just around the nine. Hasn't really done much. Um, nothing going on in corn. Soybeans. Soybeans the same as corn, about the same. And then we'll do... Uh, We'll do Bitcoin, see what looks. Here's Bitcoin. Back it out a little bit. Bitcoin's been a sideways pattern between its uh, Bollinger Bands. Been trading right around the nine, uh, nine and the 20. You can see it's gone up. Now it's come back down. It's the 20. Seems to like. You can see, you know, 
big rise in Bitcoin, sideways pattern. So that's kind of what I see, you know, it kind of confirms what Bob was talking about is, you know, I'm looking at the market, I'm looking at the big indexes, and then I break them down into the 11 sectors and trying to find something that looks good. And I'm not, I'm not seeing it. And I'm kind of like Bob, I'm not seeing it. I go to the charts to confirm it. And I'm confirming that I'm not seeing it right now. Can it turn around? Sure. But right now, it, we've been trading sideways for so long. And a lot of these patterns, I've been waiting for something to happen. And finally, this week, you're starting to see everything kind of just roll over. So Bob's, Bob's intuitions and what he feels, I can see in the charts. Now, I've been into Bitcoin and crypto since, well, 2018 or so. I've owned it, sold it, bought it, sold it. Today, I wish I just held it. But the one person who has really been, well, poo-pooed on Bitcoin and crypto in general, this week saw the light. Yes, the light. Mark and I have been pounding the table about Bitcoin in its true purpose. And that is as a asset that is store of value. Yes, this is an asset that is a limited production of 21 million coins that will slowly be, is being trickled out into the marketplace and the demand of it continues to go higher. And we've seen that since January, where Bitcoin has moved from the $30, $30,000 range to the now mid 60s to 70,000 range. And as we come into the halving, which we explain a little bit in the call, we're, we're seeing this asset that once was seen as ridiculous or buying a pet rock as many of the big brain trusts of the financial world had deemed it, are now buying into it with the approval of Bitcoin ETFs by the SEC. BlackRock, Larry Fink, its fearless leader, is all over this now. And now it's making them billions of dollars. So Kerry has come to the dark side. He is now understanding and in this next segment, he breaks it down in how he came to this understanding of what Bitcoin really is. The other thing I, I and I, I feel like I came late to the party on this one, as I explained it to Mark and Trent, I stumbled across a stock called um, Micro Securities. Micro Strategies. Micro Strategies. Uh, yesterday, and um, I came to learn that it is a company in um, somewhere in the Northeast. And what, let me let me go back to my chart. Um, Just before you get any further, you will be getting an official tinfoil hat. For what you're about to say, what 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 is that about? The oh, tinfoil uh, hat. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a it's, it's a UFO thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is micro strategies. Um, it was a company that was founded in um, 1983. And um, I probably need to go more than, let me look, five years. Uh, and back in 2020, and I was just watching a video on the founder of this company <clears throat> by the name of uh, Michael Saylor. And Michael Saylor felt that his company was going to um, be eaten alive by Microsoft because and he couldn't compete because he was trying to do the same thing and that the company was going to die so he devised the strategy to go out 
and take all the cash he had and in the company and buy Bitcoin. And he did that in 2020. So as a result of that, he, he currently has $13 billion worth of Bitcoin inside of this company. He has more Bitcoin in that company than any other company in the world. He did it before Elon Musk did it. And you can see what happened to his stock. And if we come up here and we add Bitcoin to the chart, that's Bitcoin. And as you can see, his stock started reflecting the movement of Bitcoin. Okay, now I want to take it down to one year. And what happened there, this is Bitcoin now. This is his stock. Because what he did was he then went out and mortgaged his company. And he took the assets of the company and he borrowed money against them and he bought more Bitcoin. So he leveraged up. And that's what's happened. So I saw this and I think it's in today's video. Uh, I came across it and I says, I had no idea what this company does. And I didn't until last night when I did some research and I realized what it is. This is a another way to buy Bitcoin. But as it looks to me, because of the difference between this and this, it's a way for you to benefit from his leveraging up his company. I could achieve this same thing if I mortgaged my house and bought Bitcoin with it. But in my mind, I'd rather him take the risk than me. So that if he's wrong, all I lose is what I've invested in here and not lose my house. That's my interpretation of it. I bought 10 shares of it no more than a half an hour ago. So I've got about $14,000 invested in it. In fact, I got it for $1,460. So I'm already up uh, $16 per share. I would encourage you, write down the name. And again, I'm late to the party. Write down the name, uh, Michael Saylor. I just watched a video with uh, Peter Demandis. Trent and Mark tell me I also need to watch one with Lex Friedman. Yeah. And learn about this. Um, and, and make your own decision. But it looks to me like this is a guy, as he says in, in his interview, he has no fear. Um, fear is not something that he has ever dealt with. Um, and so he basically saved his company and mortgaged his company to buy Bitcoin. And so if you don't want to mortgage your house and you want to participate in Bitcoin, this might be a way to go about it. Okay. I hope that's. I hope that's worth the price of entrance. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I think it's it's one of those. Is that because that... you you be, because I finally came across to Bitcoin? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm a slow also, learner. There are also aliens too. <laughs> All right. So. Okay. If you say so. I think. Um, I, in the, I'll put the Lex Friedman one up. It's three and a, it's th almost four hours long interview, and it's a very high level conversation between the two because 
Mark, correct me if correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Lex Freeman's a rocket scientist I, or something like that. Really? Oh yeah, he's like ridiculously smart. Really uh, smart. Really he's, smart. He's crazy. Well, Mike, Michael Saylor went to MIT, and I think he was aerospace dynamics, aerospace engineer. Okay. Yeah. And so their conversation is really high level. But I think that you get there if you watch it a couple, you know, a time or two or rewind certain sections of it, he explains his process. He was not one of those, we need to change the currency system. No. We need to de get out of the central bank system. He looked at it from the standpoint of, you know, the the concept of um, minimum supply and demand and what it and what it represented from the standpoint of um, um, store of value versus a currency. And that I think also, you know, a lot of people say the whole cryptocurrency title is misleading. It's not a currency. It's right. In the case of Bitcoin, it's a store of value. And if you think of store of value from this perspective of um, if I buy something, does it hold its value over time? If I keep uh, my um, if I keep my money in a savings account in U.S. dollars, is my dollar still have the buying power that it did pre, you know, uh, a year earlier? And his argument is no. And if you look at the value of the U.S. dollar, because we mean we manufacture dollars over and over through printing, we're diluting our dollar share. So Bitcoin represents a store of value and it holds its value because you cannot there will be no more than 21 million Bitcoin. And there will be less available as we go. I think it's. I think the last Bitcoin will be mined, I think, in. 2149, I think it is. He I watched that and I thought he said the 115, 115 years will be the last one. By the yeah, time they yeah. have, it'll be like it'll be like a little Satoshi's when they get to the final halving. Yeah. But what we're seeing, what is happening, the whole big movement here recently with the ETF approval um by the SEC, but also the halving, which comes next week between they say the 20th, but, but I've heard seen the 17th through the 21st. At some point in that range, it's supposed to hit its magic number. And, and the number of Bitcoin that is being mined today is 900 a day. That will get kind of to 450. And then four years from now, 2028, 20, it'll be 200. And uh, 25, 25. Will be, yep. yeah, will be mined. And then so on and so forth. And that's why it's so far out in the last Bitcoin that will be mined. But his argument, and it's a very good interview. I just posted it there. I believe that's the full interview. Um, uh, is that it's we? There is not really an asset class today that you buy and the value uh, holds its value. So that if you bought it today, and it and the reason is is like gold, you can mine more gold. It's silver, you can mine more silver. Uh, commercial real estate. Um, chances are they'll build more commercial real estate and so it's a it's a very good argument for what he's doing and it's honestly saved his company and uh he has become the i guess spokesman in a big way for for bitcoin but it's interesting well there you have it cpi came out let us all know that inflation's going higher even though we've been talking about it for the last couple months, because you and I, we live in this world of inflation, where groceries are costing more money, where goods to produce products and services are costing more money. They don't feel it or think it, or at least verbalize it out of DC. But you and I, the extra, the 99% are enduring a rising inflationary market. We're now enduring a selling off of risk assets. And this really comes down to 
How are you going to protect yourself going forward? As I'm recording this, Iran just did a drone attack on Israel. This is increasing the likelihood that eventually at some point we may be sucked into another war and our people, our soldiers may be heading into danger. And I think the policies, the craziness of leaders, not just in the United States, but in the world, needs to be put in check. We are going to endure higher cost. Your assets in your 401ks, your investment accounts can and most likely will take a beating because chances are you've been told, buy for the long term, hold, it'll come back. Look at the last hundred years. Well, a hundred years ago, they didn't have drones. A hundred years ago, you didn't have the internet. A hundred years ago, you didn't have high frequency trading. A hundred years ago, it was a whole different world. And now with the exponential growth in inflation, the cost of goods, the declining power of the, the buying power of the US dollar, with inflation, real inflation, including borrowing money, along with what it costs to grow groceries, is like 18%. And if the US dollar is falling on an average in value or buying power, by 10% a year, that means what you and I experience when it comes to inflation is really 28%, which then says, well, if my portfolio goes up 12%, how much money did I really make? Well, do the math. The world has changed. How you invest is changing. It is time you take notice or you will work your entire life and you'll work harder to achieve less. And only the 1% have profited from the last three years of money printing and this ridiculousness that we have endured. So what do you do about it? You join the best of US investors. You learn how markets work. We want to teach you how markets work, how to identify the strong future sectors and companies that are changing our world, but most importantly, when to hold them and when to fold them. Peace, live loud, and live your best life every day.